Man, all right. I, I, just a couple of things I got to note. Man, it's been good enough. We can just say amen and go home. You know what? When you guys stood up and clapped for the biscuits and gravy, I said, I'm in the right place. <laughs> and I got to tell you what, after that singing right now, I'm so fired up. I'm ready to charge the gates now. I'm telling you, that's awesome. That's good. That's good stuff. Uh, my name's Hank Parker Jr. And uh, I think there's been a, after I saw everything that was going on, the guys that were speaking here, I think there's been a mix up. They either thought they were booking my dad or they've just made a mistake altogether. <laughs> I don't know how I got here, but I, I, you know, driving here this morning, seeing all this beautiful country and what, what I love to do is uh, spend time in the outdoors and just seeing the setting out here, man, I, I'm in the right place. So <laughs> I, uh, I'm honored, uh, but very humbled to, to be here this morning. And uh, usually I get the opportunity to go to these different churches and speak because of my past. I grew up, my dad's Hank Parker, the fisherman, growing up in his home, and then I spent uh, about 10 years in the NASCAR, mostly in the Xfinity and the truck series, and now for the last 10 years, I've, I've made my living uh, in the outdoor industry uh, on a television show called Hank Parker's Flesh and Blood, and, and so I get the opportunity to go around to all of these different churches and share my testimony, share what the Lord has done in my life, and talk about the outdoors and go to these different events but this morning that you guys have come together obviously it's a Saturday morning you guys are fired up and ready to go and uh, it, it's it's a little different than what I typically do so this morning what I'd really like to do with my time that I, that I have this morning I'd like to share with you really the the biggest struggle that I've had in my life the the, the longest uh that it's taken God to, to teach me a lesson in my life, that it's taken the longest amount of time, and, and at moments I slip and I forget and, and I, get, I get caught up into things. But I want to talk about purpose this morning. I want to talk about what's, what's my purpose? Why am I here? And, and, and what, what, what am I doing? I mean, listen, you know, I, I come up here, you know, I'm from North Carolina. I come down here, I stand up on a stage. You're going to hear me talk for couple hours maybe more <laughs> and and you might and, and and you might see me on television you see my dad on television you think you kind of have this idea but it might be a little bit different than what you think it might be a little bit different than what, what my normal everyday life looks like and and you really don't know any uh, person until you spend some time with them but we all have these mundane moments in life right we all have Monday mornings we all have you know, our cubicle to sit in or our truck to drive down the road in or the same old thing that we're doing day in and day out. And when it gets hard, when it gets frustrating, when it gets difficult or when it gets boring on either end of the perspective, I don't know about you, but for me, I, I, I kind of sometimes look for the easy way out and look for comfort. And, and I, I, I try to make a change and I, and I start questioning, man, what am I doing this for? What, what is my purpose? And so I'm, I'm going to spend a little time this morning in Colossians chapter 1. If you've got your Bible, I'll go ahead and turn there. But really, to get us there, to get us there, I want to share, I want to share a bit of my story. I need to start kind of at the beginning so that I can set this up to, to talk about what I feel like the Lord has, has taught me. And, 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 and as I said, I, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't think... I'm alone in this battle. I think as men, we all face this, this struggle with our jobs and, and in life. But, you know, growing up as, as uh, my dad, a professional fisherman, you know, uh, if you love to hunt and fish, I grew up in the right home. Uh, my dad used to tell people uh, he, would, uh, he would fish to make enough money so he could go hunting. <laughs> if you're a kid that loves the outdoors, I, that was a good place. And I was going to grow up, uh, my dream in life, a lot, of, a lot like a, a, a lot of little boys, my dad was my hero. And I, I thought, I'm going to be just like my dad. I'm going to grow up and be a professional fisherman, and I, I'm going to follow in his footsteps and do those things. But as I got older, uh, I, I, my love for hunting far outweighed my love for fishing. I love to fish, and that's, that's a good time, and I enjoy it, but I didn't have it quite as, as bad as I did the hunting thing. And so I loved to hunt. My daddy loved it too. And so, you know, I was on a hunting trip with my dad about uh, when I was about 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, and Dale Earnhardt came out uh, to, to my dad's farm. And I grew up in a little town called Denver, North Carolina. And right beside us is Mooresville, Race City, USA. You know, our little sign there says Race City, USA. And that's where all the race teams are located. So I grew up in the heart of racing. 
my dad loved to watch racing. I tried to race go-karts for a little bit, you know, as a kid. And my dad told me I couldn't fight good enough to race go-karts. So I need to figure something else out. <laughs> so Dale Earnhardt came on this trip, and he brought his son, Dale Jr. And we, we, we you know, uh, had a great time. And we started hanging out after that. And started, I started going to the race, racetrack with him. He asked me if I'd ever been to a race, you know, and growing up around it, being around that, that part of the world you just kind of take it for granted, but I'd never really hung out in depth with it. And he, so he kind of took, started taking me to the racetrack. He was racing these little Legends cars and, and, and other stuff over at Concord Speedway, and, and, which is the local track where we live. And uh, so I started going with him and hanging out, and man, I fell in love with it. I absolutely loved it. Now, keep in mind, I grew up in a good home. I grew up in a great home. I, my dad, a lot of people ask me about my dad. You know, he's got that, uh, he's got that personality of the all shucks, you know, good old boy, always smiling. God bless you. I'm Hank Parker. And that's really what my dad, my dad's just kind of that way. That's just, my dad is really good on camera, but he's just being himself. Now he's very competitive. So if you catch more fish than he does, he might not be as smiley. <laughs> and why not talk to you as long? Which only maybe happened to me once or twice in my life, you know. One time we went fishing and he, he, he was telling me that they had all these smallmouth and I showed up. He said, you got to go, son, you got to go. So I showed up down there and he said, what, what you got? what you got tied on your rods. And I told him, I said, Dad, I got an eight-pound test, uh, fluorocarbon, and a little shaky. Because that, that don't work. My dad's always in control. He said, that don't work. Here, take these rods. I said, nah, I'm going to take my rods. You know, I was just pushing back, you know, a little bit, having some fun with him. And so we went to the river, and I wore him out. <laughs> I mean, I, it was the only time in my life. And it was just because I'd been reading all this stuff, and these people said, do this. And he had, you know, whatever. So he wouldn't let me go home. I'm, I, at this time, I'm 30-something years old. He wouldn't let me go home to my family. He said, you got to stay. We're going back again tomorrow. <laughs> he put on eight-pound test and went and wore me out and said, okay, now you can go home. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's my dad. I grew up in a great home. My dad came to faith in Jesus when I was a, uh, about a year old. My grandfather was kind of an outcast. If you've ever heard my dad's story, you probably heard this. But my, my grandfather was an alcoholic who came to faith in Jesus through a guy who just happened to stop by his house and share the gospel with him. And, and, and that began to bear fruit in my uh, grandfather's life. He came to faith in Jesus. And God just did a real uh, uh, powerful work in his life. He, 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 he rescued him from alcoholism. And, and so for the last four or five years of my grandfather's life, he was sober, uh, trusting and following Jesus. And he was telling my dad about Jesus. My dad didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And at my grandfather's funeral... My dad came to faith in Jesus. So I grew up in this good, good home. I grew up in this home where, you know, my dad didn't have it all figured out, which none of us do. But my dad was a very baby believer who, who, who did, not, did not go to church as a kid, you know, was not, did not grow up in a Christian home, a very good setting. But my dad, by God's grace, was, was, was motivated and, and, and pursued Jesus and pushed his family towards them. And so I grew up in this great home. A lot of love, a lot of support, and and so you know, I just I loved my daddy. I just wanted to I wanted to be just like him. And then and then on this hunting trip, everything kind of started to change. I uh, I, I, got, I started hanging out with Dale Jr. and I decided I don't want to fish. I want to race. <laughs> and and you know, if you get you know, you just think about it. Any little boy, what do they look at? Right? They look at the fire trucks and the police cars and the loud and the fast. Right? Someone. I was talking to someone earlier this morning. They said, what's it feel like to go around Talladega Speedway? And I said, it feels real good. <laughs> real good. First time I ever went to Talladega Speedway, I was about, I probably shouldn't tell this, but I will. I was about 16 or 17, and, and there was another guy driving this car. And he said, hey, Hank, you want to drive it around? I said, heck yeah. And I was real skinny back then. And, and so they took beach towels and stuffed them on the seat because he's a lot bigger than me. And uh, it was uh, uh, David Bonnet, Neil Bonnet's son, who was driving the car. And so he stuffed all these towels around me. And then they put the seatbelts on. They're kind of flopping loose. And he said, now, here's the thing. You have to hold it wide open or it'll mess up the car. I was thinking, okay. <laughs> awesome. I can do that. This side eye shaking pretty good. And I went out there on the track. Boom, boom, just shifting gears going up through there. And I'm like, this is what I was made to do. And I get going through turn 
I make one lap and I come around for the second lap and I go through turn one and the motor explodes and oil gets on the tire and the car turns completely sideways like this. I'm going 200 miles an hour. I don't know what, I'm 16 years old. I don't know what to do. So I just closed my eyes and just kept it straight. <laughs> and the car straightened out and I remember just sitting in the holler, shaking. I was just like about to cry like this for about an hour thinking, oh. but it feels good. It feels real good. <laughs> I like, I like that feeling. I like that feeling a lot. So Dale Jr.'s hanging out. I'm hanging out with him, and, and I'm going to the race with him, and I'm watching him, and I'm learning a lot about it. And I see how this correlates a lot to, to what my daddy does with just persistence and, and hard work, dedication, all of the stuff that, that goes into fishing. A lot of it correlates over to racing. And I was in Dale Jr.'s shop one day, and Dale Earnhardt came walking up, and Dale Earnhardt was a very intimidating man, super cool guy, really great hunter, good, good guy, but very, very intimidating. And he came up to me and he said, he slid his, you know, the old glasses he used to wear, he slid them down, he'd always look at you over the top of them. And uh, he said, hey boy, Dale Jr. tells me you want to race, is that true? I said, yes sir. And he said, here's what you're going to do. <laughs> he said, you're going to buy Dale Jr.'s street stock car and I think that's going to be the best way for you to start. Does that sound like a good plan to you? I said, yes, sir. There's only one problem. He said, what's that? I said, I don't have any money. <laughs> he said, that's all right. I'll talk to your dad for you. <laughs> Dale Earnhardt was my drafting partner. That's awesome. <laughs> so I got my start in racing. And, man, I was, you know, as I grew up, I was a good kid. I, I, I grew up in church. I didn't, I wanted, I, I loved hanging out with my daddy. My daddy is my buddy. But I grew up in this shadow of I'm Hank Parker's kid. You know, they used to give all the sponsors and stuff, would give him jackets with his name on it. And it, he'd give them to me because I'm Hank Parker Jr. And, uh, and so I'd like proudly wear those around. And, but I always grew up, oh, this is kind of a limelight on my dad who came from this really tough background, this tough setting. They didn't have very much money. His family, his dad was, 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 was really, you know, uh, checked out physically and, and mentally due to alcoholism and stuff once my dad got to about 10 years old. And so he didn't have a lot of support. He didn't have any money. He goes to the bank, borrows a bunch of money, buys a boat, and goes and becomes successful. And that's a big deal, man. I mean, you, as a guy, deep down inside of every one of us, we all, we all want a piece of that, don't we? We, always, we? we all want to make something of ourselves, and my dad did that. And I grew up in this, I grew up in this shadow, and I loved my daddy, but I, I, I wanted to make him proud and do the same thing. I wanted to be successful. And I saw this opportunity in racing as, and this is, this is a, I, something I love, and this is a great opportunity for me to be, be, become uh, successful, uh, known, and be my own man. And so I would not be known as, as, as Hank Parker's kid, but I would rather be Hank Parker Jr., the race car driver. And so I saw this opportunity, and, and, and I began racing. And my dad was so supportive, and he started, he, st he, he was very involved. He even tried to race some. My dad has an issue where he confuses bravery with a, no fear. <laughs> so he, he, like, wrecked a lot of stuff. <laughs> Uh, there has to be that filter, uh, but anyway, he, he was very supportive, and, and my mindset and everything that I wanted to do always centered around, I want to be a winner, and I want to be successful, so when other kids in high school were out partying and doing stupid stuff and trying, trying to, I mean, I had, you know, I, I was a kid, I was normal like everyone else, but I wasn't really pursuing that path that a lot of kids were because I didn't want to do anything to get in the way that would stop me from winning. I want to win, and that's what drove me, and that was my motivation. And so I didn't, I didn't, I was a, I was a pretty decent kid, you know, all through high school. And then once I graduated high school, my dad and I just kind of sat down. I said, you know, obviously we can look at my, uh, my report cards and my, my history at school and understand maybe college is not a great idea for me. <laughs> I would really like to race. That was a hard sell, but I put, it, I put it on my parents. And so my dad and I sat down, and we came up with this, this plan, and we devised this whole thing, and we, came, we put it together. Of this is where I want to be and how I want to get here. And my ultimate goal was to, to race in the elites. My ultimate goal was to be successful, to win, and, and, and be my own man. And so I pushed towards that. 
Now, when I was a kid, when I was about 10 or 11 year, years old, I, I, you know, growing up in a church, kind of uh, what seems to be a lot like this church, I made a profession of faith. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I understood the fact that I was a sinner. I understood that I was broken. I understood that, 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 that God sent Jesus to die on my behalf. But I didn't really think that much about Jesus. I didn't really think that much of, about what God had, had, had done. I didn't think much about that. What I really wanted was this ticket to go to heaven. You know what I mean? I, I just was afraid of hell. I raised my hand. I signed the card. Did the whole, whole thing. And, 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 and so I, I kind of had this understanding, but yet a lack of understanding. Does that make sense? And so I, I grew up kind of in, in, in this culture, this church culture, good people, some wonderful people at where I grew up in church. And, and when I got into racing, I was introduced to a whole new world of people, you know. Uh, it was very different. I started working in race shops, and it was just a lot different. And, and then somehow, subconsciously, along the way, I just decided I didn't want to, I didn't want to be, a, a, you know, this good guy, this really goody two-shoes type person because I couldn't have fun. I mean, how am I going to be a good race car driver who drives 200 miles an hour and not afraid of death and all of that sort of stuff and have fun and live that kind of lifestyle and, and be this really goody-goody person, right? And so I, I kind of, in my mind, kind of just made up this thing where I don't want to be this really, really bad person, but I don't want to be this really good person either. Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want people, I don't want to be awkward and weird, but I don't want to be the guy that they read about does really, really bad things. So I'm just going to go along with the crowd because ultimately what's most important to me is that I'm a winner and I don't care about anything else. I just want to be successful and I just, I want to win and that's what I'm here for. And so that's, that's how I lived my life from about age 20 uh, to about 25 my career was going really, really good. Things were really happening uh, as far as the, the racing stuff was going. I, I, uh, I raced in this, the lower ranks, worked my way up. And then I got to what they call now the Xfinity Series, and I drove from my dad. I had some setbacks, and I had some hard times in the beginning. It was a lot of work, and it's so difficult to explain to people what a life like when you're pursuing a career as, a, as an athlete, and, and that's what you're trying to do. The, the things that you do and, and the sacrifices that you make to try to be successful, so few people make it. It's just kind of hard to, to, to help people understand that. But as men, we've all had a dream to do something, right? And, and, and as I was going, man, I was, I'm right here all around where my dream is as a kid. And in the Xfinity series, I, I drove for my dad for a year or two and drove for some other people. And then I got this huge break and started driving for GNC. And that was, that was a big deal because they had money, which is really important in racing. And uh, first year with those guys, I won a race. And it all came together, man. It was just this, this whole idea as a little kid growing up. I mean, I, I just want to be successful. I'm at California Speedway, man. I'm telling you, Jimmy Johnson, Mark Martin, uh, Jeff Gordon, all these guys are in this race. And I won. And that's just, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's what, I, that's what I was saying on the radio. And people ask me, do I miss racing? I say, I miss that paycheck. <laughs> when I saw that payout, yeah. But it all came together. And, and, and I, I, I was, I was am amazed it was so hard, it's so hard to put together on what that would feel like. All of these plans, all of these preparations, my life just took off. Things were going really good, and I've had all these opportunities to go do this and that and things. But in the middle of that year, in the middle of that year, MRO had a guy that would come as a chaplain. MRO, Motor Racing Outreach. That you see him pray sometimes before the races. They, they have a chapel service that comes to all the races and do all the... All, all these services, and they'll pray a lot of times before the race. There's a guy named Eddie Robinson. He's from Louisiana. We got to be good buddies. And, we, and he started hanging out with me and started talking to me and, and kind of reading the Bible. He started a small Bible study. I would go to it every now and again. But the honest truth is I didn't really care about that because I, I did, it didn't help me win. And, and so I didn't really care. And I had grown to this place 
to where when I was a little kid and, and I was going to the church, I said, I said, you know, hey, there's things in my life that I'm never going to do. <laughs> I will never do this or I will never do that. And at this point, at about 24 years old, man, I, not only did, had I done them, but that was my normal mode of life. And I'm not going to stand up here and give you some crazy story like I was an alcoholic and all this crazy stuff happened in my life. Let me just tell you, I was pushing his heart back against God because I wanted to be my own God. I didn't want to, I, I felt like what I understood about the gospel was this, that God was really angry and that I needed to do this and that everything would be all right as long as I didn't mess up. And I had messed up enough that God was just probably done with me. That's a very distorted view of the gospel. That's a very distorted view of the gospel. That was the view I had. And this man sat with me, and he read the Bible with me, and he walked me through stuff. And over about a year and a half of time, I came to faith in Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was 25 years old, and, and, and I, I can't... I can't explain to you exactly how it all worked out, but God just removed, just, just, I'd heard the gospel, but I never really heard it. You know what I mean? I, I, I think I kind of understood, but for the first time I realized that while I am hostile and while I'm an enemy of God, he sent his son on my behalf, who took my sin and shame, and then gave me his righteousness. Man, I was blown away with God's grace, blown away with it. And so, Man, I got married. My career continued to go. Things were going good. Now I'm walking in this, this path, this career as a believer and, and having success. And I can remember this very notable guy in the media of NASCAR sat with me. And we did an interview. And he told, he told me, he said, as long as you don't do anything stupid, you're, you're, on your, you're well on your way, kid. Keep your head on straight. Don't do anything stupid. And I, I, I can remember, yeah, that, that, that was good. That was good to hear that. And uh, I, I could go through a lot of details, but at the end of my second year with GNC, we were supposed to go to another team, and, and we were going to go to the team that won the championship, and we had a long-range plan to race cup. I actually raced in the cup series a little bit with Ray Everham that year. And, and, and just to make a long story short, my career fell apart. <laughs> I, I, I could explain to you some of the details, but in, uh, even in retrospect, as I look back, it just fell apart. I was supposed to do this deal with GNC. Uh, they ended up getting out of racing completely because of some legal issues in their business and things like that. And they had to leave the sport, which left me high and dry. I was without a job. Dale Jr. gave me a ride. I drove the Chance 2 car about four or five times. I drove another car. I finished in the top five in every race that I raced in the next year, and I couldn't get a job. I did some stuff with Carl Edwards and Jack Roush. Couldn't get a job. And just this after everything. And I can remember when GNC told me that they were not going to come back. I got my rental car. It was at Miami Homestead Speedway. I got my rental car, and I was beating the steering wheel and just yelling at God. I give you my life. I try to follow you. Try to do the right thing. And this is how you reward me. This is how you reward me. And you take my career away from me. And this began this process of God teaching me. Teaching me that my purpose in life isn't to be a successful race car driver. My purpose in life isn't to get out from underneath my daddy's shadow. My purpose in life isn't to become rich, famous, the best, any of that. That's not my purpose. And so it took years. And as, as I was walking through this, there was a guy, Eddie, uh, the guy who, who shared the gospel with me, moved on. He became a missionary. And another guy stepped in. And he would meet with me every Tuesday, every Tuesday for about two or three hours. And for a year and a half, we read the book of Philippians. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, you can read the book of Philippians in about 20 minutes. But I'm just a knuckle-dragon redneck, and it took a couple years with me. But he slowly walked me through how to read the Bible and how to understand the Bible. And he taught me this, that my purpose 
as distorted as what I was thinking it was, that I highlighted I had made king over my life, is never devoid. It is never disconnected from my position. As believers in Jesus Christ, your purpose is always rooted in your position. And when we confuse that and we place purpose over position, then we distort what our purpose is. Uh, I told you I was going to look at uh, Colossians chapter 1. Just listen, just, just listen to this in Colossians chapter 2, and, I, and I'll, I'll hit this text. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Listen, your position and my position as believers in Jesus Christ is that we have been set free and that we have been brought into the fold of God. You have been rescued from the dominion of darkness. You have been rescued from the power of Satan and you have been brought into the kingdom of God's son, Jesus Christ. If that is all I ever accomplished in my life, and I can't accomplish that, God graciously gives that to me. Listen, we 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 Romans sets up the gospel in such a beautiful way that you feel like you're in this courtroom, right? And and we've all heard it explained that way. But we stand before the judge. And in my early years distorting the gospel, the part of it what I understood is that we stand before this judge, this holy, righteous judge judge who demands absolute perfection in thought and deed and that any blemish that any anything going to the side of that is 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 a violation against his holiness and it isn't that that we're just made right with this judge it's the fact that we are sinners broken pushing hard against God hostile towards God enemies of God we we are born sinners and we freely choose to be sinners And so we stand before this holy and righteous judge and we deserve his wrath. We deserve his punishment. But instead, through the gospel, what he says is your punishment has been, it's not been, it's not just swept to the side. It's been dealt with in Jesus Christ. All of your punishment that is owed you and deserved you, I gave to my son. He bore it. And, and, and then in this beautiful exchange where he takes our sin and our shame, he gives to us his righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might be the righteousness of God. That is our position. And so we, a lot of times, guys, we stay in that courtroom. We stay over there. We, we, we just say, okay, I'm in the courtroom. I know, I know I'm guilty. I know I deserve this wrath. And so I'll just stand to the side and try to, try to not get in the way. No, God doesn't leave us in that courtroom. The beauty of the gospel is that he takes us out and places us into the family. My wife and I are in the process of adopting a kid from, from the country of Haiti. And as we go through this process and we work through this, it is such a beautiful picture of the gospel. That God comes in and ransoms us and pulls us out of the muck and the mire and sets us up into his family. And we have been joined. We have unity with Jesus. And so we are heirs. We are heirs. We are sons of God. That is our position. So let me just say this as I, as I kind of walk through this passage. If we confuse the fact that our purpose is over our, our position in Christ... We need to stop and rethink about the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that you deserve, you deserve God's wrath, but he so graciously ransoms you through the gospel of Jesus and places us into the family. So here's, here's, here's what I want to look at. I want to look at Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 20, uh, verse 24. And, and, and here's, these are the words of the Lord. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. For the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. All right, there's two big things that just jump out to me. You know, I go through life and, 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 and all of us do this. On the backside of my racing career, I can remember waking up in the morning thinking, all right, I, I've been this, this race car driver I've been, my mind's been set on winning for years. Okay, I don't have a job racing anymore. What do I do? What am I here for? I sit in, I sit in a little office and edit, you know, hunting videos and other types of videos most every day of my life. And, and it gets, you know, there's deadlines and, 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 it, and it's the same old thing over and over again. Some guy shoots a deer, they turn around, they over-celebrate <laughs> and you do it again, Right? And I think, is this what I'm put on this earth to do? What is my purpose? And Paul is writing to this church. He did not plant this church. As a matter of fact, a guy that had heard the gospel from Paul, Epaphras, plants, heard the gospel, is saved, goes back and plants this church. And so Paul is by way of introduction, introducing himself. And the very thing that he's telling these guys is, here's my purpose. Here's my purpose to advance the gospel and make disciples. We see this right here. He says this, to make the, verse 25, he says, to make the word of God fully known. His mission was to advance the gospel. He was here to tell people that this mystery that may have been hidden for in, the, in the Old Testament and, and has now been brought to light in the person and work of Jesus Christ, that he is here to save sinners. That was his purpose, is to advance this gospel message. And not only to do that, but to make disciples. And that's where it gets tough. And so there's three things in this text that I just really, I feel like Paul highlights. A motive, the motivating factors. There's three motivating factors right here that help us understand exactly uh, how do we stay motivated in this mission of Jesus. And so... Um, the, the very first one in verse 25 is, is the fact that I'm called to this purpose. Paul points out to them that he is called to this purpose. Verse 25, look at it. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. Listen, as a believer in Jesus Christ, when you come to faith in Jesus, he gives you a gift to serve Christ and to serve his church. It doesn't matter if you're, Paul was a missionary church planner. You may not be a missionary church planner. You, you, may, you may work on a tractor. You may work in an auto shop. You might be an accountant. You might, you might have, be a school teacher. It doesn't matter exactly where your, your calling is in life or what your vocation is. Your purpose is rooted much deeper than what you do. And that your purpose, just like Paul's, is this, to advance the gospel and make disciples. As men, we have been called to lead our homes, our families, our communities, and our churches. And men, we have been called to be on mission about this purpose. But we cannot confuse the fact that our position is that we are first sons of God. We've been adopted into his family. And that's what fuels us to go forward. Because you're a sinner, broken, and was saved by God's grace, then we should be motivated to go out and tell other people about this gift that God so lavishly gives. And so, so your calling and your purpose is that, no matter where you're at. As men, we, should, we, we get all excited. We come to these meetings, and, or, or we may hear a sermon, and we get all excited and think, hey, I believe that, to advance the gospel and, and, and that advancing the gospel and making disciples starts where you live, work, and play. Don't get on an airplane and go to Africa just right off the bat because you get all excited. Start where you live, work, and play. Every man, woman, and child needs to hear and have an opportunity to respond to the gospel multiple times in your sphere of influence. What if we took accountability for our communities? What if we took accountability in our workplace and said, Every person that I live by, work around, I want them to hear and have the opportunity to respond to the gospel multiple times. What would that look like? God's called you and I as ambassadors. We don't have, listen, this is great 
I mean, it's awesome for me to be here, and it's awesome that, that we get to come together in this. But at the end of the day, God is calling you where you live, work, and play to be an ambassador for Jesus. And that's going to be living it, and that's going to be vocalizing it. And so the second motivating factor I see in verses 27 is just this, I'm thankful for God's grace. Verse 27 says this. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Listen. The people that would be reading this letter were pagans. The people of Colossae were pagans. They worshiped false gods. Their lives were wrecked by the gospel. God changed them. And now they have this church. And, and, and Paul is saying, you're to be thankful for the grace of God, the hope of glory. So you, th- you think about these people who were not perfect. They wasn't just these great people and all of a sudden a church planted up. No, they're pagans that God redeemed and rescued and planted a church in the middle of. Stop and think just for a second about yourself. Where were you? Think about that just for a second. There is not a man in this room who deserves the gospel. God sent his son to shed his blood on our behalf. When you are at your worst, pushing back against God, God in his grace said, that one's mine. And God came in, stepped in, and redeemed you and rescued you. Boom. Close it up. Let's, let's shut down shop, right? That's what fuels. That's what motivates us. I'm just overwhelmed by his grace. And so we don't look at people. Sometimes in the church, man, I... We talk about, oh, let's, let's go help them. Let's go help them. And I get what we're saying, but let me tell you something. We're them too. I need God's grace desperately. And so God saved you. And, and, and it's not by your own merit. We know that. And he's calling you to go out because, because of this grace. And so the first thing that, that we see is that we're called to it. The second thing that we see is that we should be thankful for this grace. And that's what motivates us. We can't earn God's favor. We can't earn any of this, but we are so gracious for it that it fuels us to go forward. And then the last thing is that we are, God doesn't send us on this mission alone. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 29. For this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me listen he didn't he doesn't leave us as orphans in this world he sent his holy spirit and you don't have to have all the answers you don't have to have it all figured out that guy i was telling you about eddie robinson is an old country guy from louisiana i love him to death and i would tell him this but he's not a very good communicator he didn't have all the best answers you know what he did he hung out with me Half the time was we'd go bowling when we go to the racetracks or go do something crazy, like shoot skeet or just do something fun. And he would hang out and he would talk to me. And we would just talk about life and he would hear where I was at and he would want to know what I, I was reading or listening to or watching. And he just engaged me. And he engaged me and shared the gospel over and over with me. You know what? It wasn't any, there was no magical words this guy said that I can point back to. I do remember he asked me a question one time that just the Lord used to stick with me about what God gave on my behalf. And, and, and I remember I had a hard time. That was God at work in me. That was God at work in his words. Listen, you don't have to go get a PhD. It'd be great if you want to. Awesome. Go do it. But we can go where we live, work, and play with the gospel study study to show yourself approved learn the answers work hard it's worth it it's good it's good to know the bible it 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 gives me encouragement it fills me up and it helps to talk to people but at the end of the day i'm not relying on my ability it's god at work in me to redeem a people he is here to save. The, Lord. the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. And the guy that you live across the street from, that you think there's no hope, let me tell you something. You have no idea. God may be at work in that dude's life, calling you 
to go share the gospel with that man. And we just don't give up. We don't, this is good. So, so, so don't, please don't, please, I, I don't want to go too far with this. So please don't mishear me on this. We don't just walk up to someone and hand them a track and walk away and never have anything to do with their life. Listen, God uses that in people's life and that's good. But our normal mode of everyday life, our normal mode, you can do that and that's a good thing. But your normal mode is, is let me, let me just ask you, who are the three guys in your life? Who, are the guy, who is the guy that does not know Jesus at all, but will come to your house to watch the Super Bowl because he's your buddy you're sharing the gospel with? Who, are the, who is the young guy in your life that you're helping grow up in his faith? That's our normal mode. That's as believers, as ambassadors, that's what God has called us to do. Now, we may go do things that, that are very emphasized on evangelism and things like that. And that, that's good. I do, I do that a lot. But at the end of the day, I'm coming home and I'm hanging out with Dave Tomasetti and Scott Sherrill. You don't know who they are. They're my buddies. And they're, they're, some of them are pouring into me and I'm pouring into others. God has called us to advance the gospel and to make disciples. And that takes work. But he's only done that because, number one, he's called us to that. It's only by his grace that we've been brought into his family. And he's empowered us by the Holy Spirit. Your position is what fuels your purpose. Don't lose sight of it, man. Get fired up. It's awesome you're here and you're fired up. Keep that candle lit. Keep going. Keep your nose buried in the word of God. Knowing where your position is. And let's be on mission. So that every man, woman, and child, where we live, work, and play, has multiple opportunities to hear and respond to the gospel. Let's pray.